Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, and uh, we are in our third study in the book of Isaiah, and we come to the third chapter. So grab your Bible, open it up to Isaiah chapter 3, and we will begin in verse 1. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is available for you to study the entire Bible verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation. Just click on the book you want to study and the chapter and follow along as I teach it verse by verse. And that can be found at the Bible verse by verse dot com. So we're in Isaiah chapter three, verse one, and we pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 1. And God is talking to his disobedient people, and he's warning them about judgment to come. He's also explaining why they are so miserable, and it's because of their sin. So he says in verse 1, For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole store of bread, and the whole store of water. So they're going to be suffering. Even the basics won't be there. You know, in the past, when they walked with the Lord, they had more than enough they were extremely wealthy and blessed by god in every way but now that's not the case and it's only going to get worse and notice how god refers to himself as the lord almighty that proves that he can do anything he wants to do and that can that proves that he's going to make good on his threats the Lord Almighty refers to the fact that God is the self-existing one and the one who controls all things. So you try to stop God from doing what he said he's going to do, you might as well just give it up. It's not going to happen. You're going to lose that fight. Verse 2, the mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet and the prudent and the ancient, God's going to get rid of all these guys, all these valuable leaders. They're going to suffer. He continues, verse 3, the captain of 50 and the honorable men and the counselor and the skilled artificer and the eloquent orator. All these people who used to be so valuable will become worthless or non-existence. He's going to remove all Israel's leaders, at least good ones. Verse 4, and I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. Instead of statesmen for leaders, Israel will be stuck with immature brats, self-centered, whiny little brats, people without wisdom and people without experience will be Israel's new leaders. God's judgment on a nation sometimes comes in the form of unwise leaders. And that's especially true in a democracy. Because, you know, in a democracy, le leadership is like water. It never rises above its own level. It's a reflection of the hearts of the people. Verse 5, and the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the elder, and the base against the honorable. So lack of respect for proper authority. And I see so much of this with children who do not respect their parents and the parents don't do anything about it. 
they let them get away with it. And they don't realize that they are their child's worst enemies by doing that. Just rebellion at every level. That doesn't make for a very pleasant society. He continues in verse 6. When a man shall take hold of his brother in the house of his father, saying, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let this ruin be under thine hand. They'll be desperate for decent rulers. Anybody. I, I mean, you got clothes, man. You be our ruler. You qualified. You got a, you got a robe. Verse 7, in that day he shall swear, saying, I will not be a healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not the ruler of the people. I don't want the job. Nobody with half a brain would take a job like that. You see, holiness blesses a nation, just like it blesses an individual or a family. But God often judges a sinful people by changing their circumstances in their society. It just isn't as good as it used to be. Good times turn into bad times. Relationships, which were once strong and right, become strained and broken. These are the results of sin. These are the results of giving in to your sinful lusts. No good comes from it. Verse 8, for Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen. It is a mess. It used to be the crown jewel of the world. Under Solomon's reign, at least at the beginning. Now it's a mess. It's, it's ruined. Ruined, decayed by its own moral rot. Here it goes, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. They thought they'd do things their way, not God's way. And look what it got them, ruin. Verse 9. Verse 9 says, the show of their countenance doth witness against them. They look miserable because they are miserable. And they're miserable because they're filled with sin. And they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. They flaunt it, much like today in America. Sin is flaunted. Greed is called self-promotion. Bragging, arrogance is called self-promotion. Homosexuality is running rampant, and people are proud of it. They don't. Nobody hides any sins anymore. They hide it not. I mean, it's one thing to sin and know that you're guilty and know that you're doing wrong. That's the way it used to be in this country, but it's not that way anymore. Now people sin and they're proud of it. And nobody says anything. You think you're going to get away with that? You think this country is going to get away? You think you're going to get away with that? You are not because sin is real. And you can become comfortable in it. And you can say that it's all right, and 99.9% .9 of the people around you can say that it's all right, and the government can legislate it and say it's all right. It's not all right. It's wrong. And it's going to destroy. That's what happened in Israel. Nobody thought anything of it. Oh, we're not old-fashioned like we used to be. We'll be okay. Eh, snicker, snicker. Used to be called sin. Not anymore. We're sophisticated. You know, this is this is modern Israel. This is modern America. We roll our eyes at the word sin. It's going to catch up to you. Does every single time. You can call sugar and sand unleaded regular or unleaded premium, but if you put it in your gas tank, I don't care what you call it, it's still going to ruin your car. Woe unto their soul, last part of verse 9. For they have rewarded evil unto themselves. They did it to themselves. 
See, I've said this so many times, and it's true. Sin comes fully loaded with its own punishment because it's so unnatural. And in this world that God has designed to operate under holiness standards, when you are unholy and you live in sin, it's not going to go well with you. So they brought evil upon themselves. You say, I, I wish God would judge sinners. Forget it. He will. He will on Judgment Day. But chances are, long before Judgment Day, they're going to feel, they're going to feel the destruction that comes from their own evil. Verse 10, say unto the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruits of their doings. You just hang in there if you're doing what's right. Because God's going to bless you. Even if the whole world, everybody around you is doing wrong, you just cling to the word of God and continue to do right. Because God is saying, it's going to be well with you. It's not going to be well with them. But it's going to be well with you. You just hang in there. And he says in verse 11, Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with them. For the reward of his hands shall be given him. They're going to get what they've got coming. And the wages of sin is death. And the wages of sin is confusion. And the wages of sin is ruin. And they're earning a big pile of wages. 12. As for my people, children are their oppressors. And women rule over them. And this is judgment from God because women are not supposed to be in charge. They're supposed to be in charge of the home. You say, oh, that's shocking. I've never heard such a thing. You're such a throwback. Well, thank you. Just giving you the word of God. You tell me if society is better now than it was 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Oh, my people, they that lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. See, God's not going to be mocked. Moral depravity is going to have a negative effect on the personal life. And national life. 13. The Lord standeth up to plead. He's not giving up. The Lord standeth up to plead. And standeth to judge the people. God will plead with you to repent. If you refuse, he will judge you. He never judges without warning. And he's warning you today. Repent. If the Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. Repent, or you're going to be judged. 14. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of his people and the princes thereof. For ye have eaten up the vineyard. The spoil of the poor is in your houses. So they had rulers. This is another judgment. They had rulers who abused their power and took advantage of the people rather than serving the people. 15, what mean ye that ye beat my people to pieces and grind their, the faces of the poor, saith the Lord God of hosts? If they had the power to do something, they use that power, actually they misuse that power to hurt those who were vulnerable. And God noticed it. If you take advantage of the poor, you take advantage of the vulnerable simply because you have the authority in this world to do it. You are sinning and you will be held accountable. And God notices it. He sees it from his place in heaven. And he would say to you, what mean ye that ye beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord God of hosts. And so God here is speaking to the leaders of his people. And he is not at all pleased with them because they are hurting his people with their wickedness. 16. Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, the women were prideful, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go and making a tingling with a tinkling with their feet, that means they're dressed to kill. That means they're dressed to draw attention to themselves. The daughters of God's people 
were not godly women. They dressed to draw attention to themselves, and they behaved like the heathen. Why else would a woman do that? It is heathenistic. I don't care who you are. If you're a Christian woman, you call yourself a Christian woman, and you dress and you show your breasts, or you wear short skirts, or tight clothing. Look, God knows why you're doing that. He knows it's not an accident. You're drawing attention to yourself. You're acting like a heathen. You're acting like a whore, like a harlot. And what really irks me is when I see women in church who are dressed to draw attention to themselves so that people look at them. How dare you dress in a manner that draws attention to yourself in the house of God where all attention is supposed to be on Jesus? And if your pastor was worth, if your pastor was worth his salt, he'd send you home. I've done it. I'd do it again. So no wonder nobody wants you to preach in their church. Yeah. Verse 17, therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion. And the Lord will uncover their secret parts. The young women flaunted their appearance. So God's going to remove their beauty. See, if, the, if their preacher really loved them and cared about them and cared about the people in that church and cared about Jesus, he would confront a woman who's dressed like that. He would send her home because he would be doing her a great favor. It's not about hating her. It's never any fun to correct someone when they're sinning. But Jesus is at stake. The men are at stake. Who, who are going to look at you? Say, yeah, but men should look at women like, you're out of your mind. That's just reality. Men look at women. And they lust after women, especially when they are dressed provocatively. And this is what the women in Israel were doing, and God is rebuking them for that. They were flaunting their appearance, so God's going to remove their beauty. He'll hit them right in a sore spot, right in their sin. 18. In that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their hair nets and their round ornaments like the moon. He can take away their, direct, or their decorations the stuff that they use to draw attention to themselves. He continues, verse 19, the chains and the bracelets and the spangled ornaments. He continues, 20, the bonnets and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tabrets and the earrings. Man, they were just decorated like a Christmas tree. Not quite the humble woman that, that uh, God expected them to be. He continues in verse 21, the rings and nose jewels. 22, the changeable suits of apparel and the mantles and the shahs and the crisping pins, the mirrors and the fine linen and the hoods and the veils. Some people say, oh, you know, porn stars are going to get it. They're sinning. Yeah. And so are so-called Christian women who dress like this. And so are other women who dress like this. And seek to draw attention from men to themselves in an ungodly way. I'm not saying there's, there's nothing wrong with beauty. And there's nothing wrong with being attracted to a woman. But when a woman dresses provocatively, when, when being dressed to the hilt to draw attention to herself is the most important thing to her, as obviously it was in the, in the days of Israel at this point that really upset God, that's when it becomes a problem. And God promises to remove all their decorations that they just love so much. Their main focus 
in life, obviously, and God knew it, was how they could draw attention to themselves. And again, there's nothing wrong with looking good. I think everybody, men or women, ought to look as good as they possibly can. Do, do what you can with what God has given you. There's nothing wrong with that. But when that becomes the most important thing to you, even more important than God, and when drawing, a, drawing attention to yourself in order to create lust in the hearts of men, you know, that, that is an idol, that is ungodly, that is heathenistic. And that's when God draws the line and says, that's enough. You are going to be held accountable for that. And yes, the men will be held accountable too because they shouldn't lust. But Jesus said, woe unto those who tempt. What do you think he's talking about here? Verse 24. Verse 24 says, And it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be stench. Instead of a girdle, a rent. And instead of well-said hair, baldness. And instead of a sash, a girding of sackcloth. And branding instead of beauty. God is going to remove all this stuff that you used in an ungodly way that you put before him. It's going to be gone. They were vain. And their appearance was their God. And so God's going to take all the vanity that they delight in. And he's going to exchange it all for misery. 25. The men shall fall by the sword. And thy mighty in the war, because they weren't innocent either. Men and women both committed sin. 26. And her gates shall lament and mourn, and she being desolate shall, shall sit upon the ground. It says, those who defend the city of Jerusalem are going to become the prey of their enemies because of sin. Let's go into chapter 4. And in that day, Seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, we will eat our own bread. You don't have to provide for us. You don't have to do what men are supposed to do. We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. We, we don't want to be old maids. We don't want to be single. We want a husband of some sort. And you don't have to be very good. We'll just take anybody right now. They were desperate. You see, and you know why? It's because in the day of God's wrath, the men were hard to find because so many of them died. The brave men were murdered by Israel's enemies because of their sin. God wasn't protecting them anymore. There weren't any husbands. There weren't any men left to marry. So the women are not going to be picky. They're going to have to settle for any man that they can get and just be happy with having a man. Pretty tough to come by. Verse 2. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely, for those who have escaped of Israel. You know, in the midst of all this talk of judgment, God always throws in a little bit of, of encouragement for his faithful people. And they were a remnant. And they always are. They're a small remnant today. And God always interjects here. Even in the midst of all this judgment, he interjects encouragement if you hang in there, if you're one of his. And he says in verse 3, and it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy, even everyone who is written among the living in Jerusalem. They're the only ones that are going to survive in the end are God's people. For when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. 
And so God's wrath is going to remove the wicked. And the few who remain will be amazed at how God has blessed them. They survived all that rot that they had to live with, that they had to witness, that was all around them. They didn't think they'd ever survive that. But they hung in there. And God protected them, and God blessed them. See, it pays to remain faithful to God. It pays to hang in there. Because long after the heathen and after the wicked are gone, taken away in judgment, you'll be there, and you'll be blessed better than ever. So don't give up on God. Don't give up on Jesus. Hang in there. Do what is right. God will always bless you. It doesn't mean there won't be hard times between now and then. And it, won't, it doesn't mean that, you, that it won't be frustrating because you're going to have to put up with sinners and their evil and their unfairness. But you know who else does? You're in good company because God does too. You think it, you think it affects you. You think sin and wickedness affects you. Man, it, you, you don't know anything. You're not experiencing anything. It affects God infinitely more than it affects you. Because, because God is infinitely holy. You just hang in there, though, because God doesn't lose. And you're not going to lose. Verse 5, and the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and a smoke by day and a shining of a flaming fire by night. Sound familiar? Sounds like uh, when the Israelites were traveling through the wilderness, doesn't it? He guided them by a cloud and a flame of fire at night. For upon all the glory shall be a defense. And there shall be a tabernacle for shade in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge and for a co covert from storm and from rain. And, and you know, that's, that's one thing that I thought was always so cool about how God led the Israelites through the wilderness. Yeah, yeah, it was a cloud by day so they could see it. And it was a pillar of fire by night so that so that they could see it. But it was more than that. You know, God is always doing more than one thing at a time. The cloud shaded them in the wilderness during the day when the sun was up. And the fire kept them warm on those cool nights. So, you know, it's just talking about God's provision. And again, verses 5 and 6, the cloud and the fire speaks of how God blessed his people as they travel from Egypt to the promised land. And after God punishes the wicked, he will bless and protect his people once again. And if you want to study the word of God further, I would definitely encourage you to do that because you can't get enough of the word of God. The word of God is what will sustain you, what will strengthen you, your faith, and what will enable you to persevere through difficult times in this world. It'll help you to maintain your faith and to persevere with Jesus, even when it's not easy. It's the word of God. The Bible says, God says that he has exalted his words even above his own name. So if you want to study the word of God further, you can do that at the BibleVerseByVerse.com, which is the scripture verse by verse website found at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Study the whole Bible from Genesis through Revelation using my audio Bible commentaries. Again, that's at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. And if the Word of God blesses you, would you please prayerfully consider blessing us back? Because this is a faith ministry, I depend on the prayers and the financial support of my listeners and my viewers to keep us going. And I would appreciate it. And you can give in a very secure method at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Just click on the donate button and give as the Lord may lead you. I got to go. I'll see you next time here on Scripture, verse by verse.